Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us again today. My name is Simran, and I'm with Canopy. Canopy is a co-working space based in San Francisco. And today we have a really fun talk with Fuse Projects. Um, and we have the VP of Design, Chin Li, who's going to be talking about robots and health and wellness reimagined. Um, joining her is um, Harriet, Harriet Zhou, who will be asking the questions and moderating the event. Um, at the end, we'll open up to Q&A, so you can go ahead and type your questions in the chat box, or you can digitally raise your hand. Um, I'll put the instructions as to how to do that um, in, in the chat box also. All right, well, I'll let you, um, Harriet and Chin, take it from here. Sure. Uh, Chin, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are? Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, once uh, first, I'm, you know, I'm feeling excited to see a lot of Fuse Project <laughs> co-workers here. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm VP of Design at Fuse Project, and I lead the industrial design team here. In the past 15 years at Fuse, I've worked on a big variety of design categories, including robotics, consumer electronics, furniture, personal accessory, wearable technology, healthcare, packaging, soft goods, um, and many more. And I am responsible for guiding the entire design process from um, leading concept directions through ideation to production and working also across um, uh, different disciplines to create integrated design experience for product, brand, and UI and UX. And I'm also currently the chair at the board of IDSA, uh, which is Industrial Designers Society of America. So thanks for having me today. I'm looking forward to the conversation with you guys. Thank you, Chen. And I'm Harriet, for those who are just tuning in now, and I lead communications at Fuse Project. Uh, I'm very excited to be doing this here with Chen. Thank you to everyone that signed up and are joining us from home. Um, we are here, like Chen said, to talk about the role that robotics and AI can play in wellness, as well as share a couple of projects that Fuse Project has put out over the years that really embody this idea that uh, AI and technology and learning technology can do a whole lot more than just create efficiency of process. And beyond that, we'll talk about the undeniable role that design from designing something as broad as a, a personality to something as specific and small as say the shape of a finger on a robot uh, plays in the success of connecting users to a product design for health and wellness. Um, as is usually the case in creative industries, it's pretty typical for the public to only really be exposed to the final product. So what is experienced by the time something hits the market is a final deliverable that's been completely thought through, it's been stress tested, it's been beta tested, it's been vetted by tons of super smart, super innovative people in and outside of the design industry. So this is where we can really shed a bit of light on what goes into the process leading up to that moment. Through design, we've been able to sort of help redefine what it means to be connected to one another, to be able to work on our mental health, to engage with our children in new ways, to support our aging family members at a time where we can't all physically be together, and so much more. So this is what we wanna share with everyone that's tuning in today. Uh, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Chen, as we know, the, the use of robotics and AI uh, are now pretty prevalent in how most people navigate day-to-day -day life, right? So, but really robots have been around since the industrialization. Can you talk a little bit about that history and where it all started? And then also tell us about the state of AI and robotics today. Yeah, I um, I think first first of all, I'm not the expert for robotics and AI. I think a lot of people working in the Silicon Valley knows more than me. Um, you know, I'm learning this through working at Fuse Project, through working with different clients. Um, also, you know, through the the life that get engaged with uh, different kinds of technologies. And we know that robotics and AIs are already um, very much widely used in, into many areas. Uh, I see them into kind of two different categories. 
One is the, the robots are in a very um, discreet way. Um, you know, not really in front of you, you don't see the robots. Another one is more the robots are in a more obvious way. You can, you know, clearly see the robots. So to me, the discrete way is, um, you know, usually you combine with machine learning algorithm, you know, in, um, you know, with AI and the purpose is to assist our regular life, right? So from the um, like real time translation, your Siri on your phone, your smart lock um, to autonomous driving, um, like the robotic power clothing that we designed for seismic and the snow baby bassinet that we designed for the happiest baby. So you have seen that kind of, uh, that kind of robotics growing in the consumer products. And the other robots that are more obvious, um, I think they are, you know, they are, they were created to be substitute for human. Like the robots in the airport, in the hotel to greet you, to provide information, uh, to provide uh, security service. Um, the robot arms in factory to, you know, to in the manufacturing line to help to reduce the cost and increase efficiency and robots to do the work in dangerous environment, in high temperature, in, you know, in the space, under the water. Um, my little one was studying the robots on Mars, the curiosity. Um, so that's also that type of robot. And sometimes, you know, we also see the robots, you know, to do, can do very precise work, such as um, micro robotics in the medical field uh, to help to do surgery very precisely to reduce the impact to the, you know, the human body to get rid of the, any risk for injury. Um, so many more ways that robot can help us you know, in our life in different angles. Chen, Chen, as someone who has worked on some really prominent AI and robotics products and interacted with engineers that are developing new and advanced technology every day, where, did you, where do you see robotics and AI making the biggest impact on quality of life? I think we, um, you know, we have seen a lot of uh, growth um, in, the, you know, in terms of AI and robotics, especially in the Silicon Valley in the past five to 10 years. Um, you know, you also, you know, during the growth, you also see the technology has become much more accessible smaller and more accurate sensors and faster computing and processing, you know, always connected to the cloud. Uh, so it makes it possible uh, for us to, you know, to embed the technology, to place the sensors, um, to hide them into the consumer products. Um, you know, we have, you know, because of this growth, the rapid growth, um, we also see these can play really well and, in you know in the in the wellness area, to to really help to connect people, improve uh, living space, uh, help people learn um, you know, um, help education, to build companionship, uh, to build physical, mental, and emotional health, for different age groups and different you know in different regions and even like fulfill different user needs, so. And you know, from from my experience, I really see the growth in this area has been um, in a much faster pace in the past few years. That's great. Um, at Fuse Project, you know, we've been working on AI and robotics projects for a few years now. So, Chin, I think you have a presentation, right, to kind of go over some of our our most well known AI and robotics projects. Do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Yeah, um, so it's, uh, I keep it informal, but um, I think the, the goal is to be able to share some of the work that we have done. Um, it's not everything, I think will provide a good range um, of uh, examples to you guys. So let me share my screen. Do you guys see my screen? Yes. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I think design is a medium, is a tool to enable technology, and it's also a bridge to connect innovation and technology mm -hmm. to users. Sometimes I do see um, design is a way of communication 
almost feel like a language uh, to be able to you know communicate technology the purpose to users so i'm going to walk through um, a small range of robots that we have done at fuse project i think first one's LQ. LQ is a project that will look into the lifestyle of older adults and research shows that older adults are more alone than ever before. 50% of women aged 75 plus live alone as of 2013. Um, so LQ's challenge is to help aging adults to stay connected to the world. We know that aging adults is, um, you know, most of them are losing the cognitive functions and technology is always, um, you know, being complex and being intimidating to them. And then when families or friends are not close by, uh, so how do we help them? So our design mission is to create a social companion to keep older adults connected and engaged in a natural and easy way that fits into their regular, regular lifestyle. And to design companion, uh, we think we should first create a character because a character and personality is a foundation to create a relationship, to have a mutual communication from one to another. So we look to do that, we look into a, a wide range of characters. Um, you know, a loyal pet, a wise parrot, you know, curious child, your best friend, uh, you know, your, your super helper. And, you know, in working with um, client, in working with, you know, doing the research, working with psych psychologists, we feel like the best character is to combine the loyal pet and your best friend um, so that is someone that always notice you when you're there like a pet and a friend like sam um, you know that's not being perfect but always there for you and then for the form for the look of the robot needs to be able to uh, communicate the character for people you know help people to build a relationship so we're looking to different, two different kinds of architecture, the Compose and the Unite. The Compose is basically separate the, the display uh, and the entity, and the Unite is combine the display with the entity. And, you know, during the design process, we found out um, actually when you combine the display with the entity, you kind of mixing up the character of the robot and your friends and fam family. Because the one, you know, one of the big function of the display is to bring in the content from your friends and family and be able to communicate with them. So once you combine them, the character is a mix up. Once the character is mixing up, you're not able to build a um, you know, relationship with the robots. So we decided to go with the compose, separate the display and the robot. So the final design um, is um, a very simple form. We designed it to be more like a desktop, um, a tabletop object. And rather than um, creating a face, we use one singular light to be able to express the emotion, to keep it abstract. Also, you know, give the space for in the user to create their imagination while they're building the relationship. And in the idle mode, we design um, attitude and become a beautiful essence in the home keeping it simple and elegant. And most of the elder, you know, would, would to sit at the couch. So, the, you know, the best place to place LQ is um, by the side table. And the display is also decided to be removable so the elder can uh, hold it uh, in, in their hand, you know, to continue to have the communication with their friend and family while they're walking around uh, in the space. And in working with our XD team, we also design a range of motions and you know, keeping in mind that we try to make the mechanism uh, as simple as possible. So we work with the engineer uh, to define you know, the placement for the motors, the range uh, motions for the base and for the head. The base is, uh, you know, can be rotated uh, 360 degree. The head can tilt to the front, tilt to the back. As I mentioned earlier, the, char the character is kind of combined with uh, like a pet, like your best friend. So, you know, you notice that with your pets, when you, you know, walk by in front of your pets, the pet will, you know, have a very gentle gesture. They don't need to bark at you. <laughs> your dog doesn't need to bark at you, but showing the gentle gesture, notify that, uh, you know, give you the signal that, 
they know that you are here. So we design a range of motion from very subtle gesture to some bigger range motions to show the resting mode, the standby mode, um, you know, uh, the talking, the thinking, um, the, you know, looking at the screen together. So, so all these motions and keeping it natural and easy to understand, make it intuitive uh, so the elder can you know, quickly understand what's a what is the robot doing. Um, the next one I want to talk about Moxie, and I, I think I we just. Quick, I had a quick question though. What what is XD? Experience Design. Okay. So Experience Design team, uh, we have this project is a multidisciplinary uh, um, design consultancy. So we have strategy, uh, industrial design, brand, and Experience Design. So we, uh, you know, for projects like this, we work um, very integrated together. We help uh, into the client is intuition robotics. We help them to create the name IDQ. Um, we also create and you know, how to help them to design the brand, the logo. Um, the XD team is helping to uh, work with industrial design team to design the range of motions, but they also work on the contents on the display. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you know, because this is more focused on the robot, but um, you know, the, but this project is very integrated offer from uh, from this project. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Moxie, um, we just announced Moxie, I think about one and a half week ago. So this is a brand new robot that we have done. Uh, we work with uh, Embodied uh, for about two and a half years. Um, Moxie is a smart companion robot designed to support families to help children to grow um, their social, emotional, and cognitive development. And, and Moxie is a robot with AI and machine learning so that you know, it can understand, process, respond to real life conversation. And it's able to do eye contact, um, to, um, to do facial expression, and to be able to recognize and record people, place, uh, places, and things. So different with LQ, Moxie has his own identity. He comes with a story. Moss is from the Global Robotics Laboratory, GRL, and coming to learn, you know, learn from the kids how to be a, a good friend to, uh, to human. So the stories really um, allows kids to have something to imagine, um, a question to ask, and curiosity to engage with this, uh, with this robot. And to design uh, the robot, we first we need to think about, you know, how do we design a unique look that works in parallel with the story, um, really to show the emotional intelligence uh, from inside to outside of the robot. So we work a lot on the, the head shape, the body form, the proportion from the head to the body. Um, you know, for the head, we, we, we designed this pointy head and really to give some sharpness to the robots. Um, because it's a very it's a very smart robot, uh, we want to be able to to deliver that kind of um, visual recognition of the smartness, and also because we need to have a display for the face, uh, we also need to have some you know from the physical standpoint, we need to be able to end the display. So designing this head with the hairstyle uh, can be you know can be considered as a hairstyle, can be considered as a helmet, and it's really just giving a natural stop. Um, surrounding for the for the display, um, you know the proportion of the body, the roundness to make it feel approachable. Um, also, you know, encourage uh, the touch from the from the kids. Um, you know, to so have some physical interaction. And we also need to design uh, use design to enable the physical interactions of the robots. Um, so, what we've engineered together. We kind of imagine, you know, the range of the um, the body gesture to be able to express different kind of emotions like angry, uh, being sad, being happy, uh, being uh, being curious. Um, so means we, you know, we need to have range of motion on the neck. We need to also have the entire body to be rotate 360. We need to have a joint on the belly so the robot can tilt to the front, tilt to the back, to so have a little bit more dramatic. Uh, expression, the arm needs to be able to, uh, you know, like to be able to fold and hold. 
um, typically for the hand needs to be able to, um, you know, create some further interactions, for example, like pointing to the objects, um, you know, to play games together with the kit. And to design the hand, we, um, you know, we also try to keep it simple and to keep it intuitive. Uh, so mostly focus on the index finger. Um, and then, you know, you, you see a little thumb inside the hand. So it's give you a little hint, um, you know, the complete imagination of the hand, but the index finger, it really helped to help you to understand where mouse is pointing. <clears throat> And then we work with uh, embodies for a range of faces. Um, um, you know, these are some early illustrations. We work on the size of the eyes, the spacing between the, uh, the eyes, the size of the mouth, the proportions, the spacing between the eyes and the mouth, and even the shape of the face. And you can see, you know, by changing those numbers, uh, the distance, the forms a little bit, it really translates a different kind of character. So, you know, the face design is also a big part of the, the character expression. And, you know, like all the industrial design, uh, we need to do a lot of mock-ups. Um, the team doing, uh, you know, did a really good job to visualize the, the concept from, you know, sketching to physical forms, uh, the phone cords, uh, mock-ups, 3D prints, and, and, you know, you can see the fidelity of the, the growth, like when you work on the proportion of the head, the shape of the body. And I call this the growth chart of Moxie. Um, I put down the years and the, and, and, and the months. So October 3rd, 2017, that was the first time we saw uh, the first Moxie prototype. And then March 22nd, 2018, you can see the robot has been completely redesigned based on the, the industrial design we provide. And then um, October 1st, 2019 is um, the latest uh, prototype before production. So I have a video here. We can. What's your name? My name is Josh. Nice to meet you. Josh, wow, I have so many questions. Um, how old are you? I'm 35. You must be very wise and handsome. <laughs> hey, do you like books? The GRL wants me to learn more about what humans find funny. Do you want to hear a joke? Yes. All right. What do you call it when a vampire has trouble with his house? A grave problem. It's like you read my mind. It's like I've heard that joke. A grave problem. <laughs> Can you guys see the video fine? So cute. Moxie is yeah. the cutest. That is really cute. So I actually, I have another question from, um, where did it go? Ah, where did it go? It's a question from David. Um, so he says, when I, when I think of robots, I think of human looking or that dog that opens doors. Why do some of these robots look like humans, such as Moxie, and others don't, such as the one that you showed us earlier? Yeah, like I, like I explained, Moxie has his own identity. Also, the, you know, the interactions are with the kids. And kids need to see something more realistic. So if you go to abstract, it's hard to make the connection of the story. Um, we also, when we're doing the design, we're also, you know, working with um, our clients to see how the story grows. Um, so in order to pair with the story, in order to create a complete picture, the image, and to, to push for this kind of interaction with the kids, we have to make it a little bit more realistic. And there's some, it's actually like, if you have kids, you know that, you know, kids will need to you know, be able to interact better when they're seeing something more realistic. But versus LEQ, LEQ, the focus is really to bring in connections, right? You know, I want the elder to be able to see the children, to be able to see um, the, uh, the friends. It's not about too much of the robots. It's more about the content. So the robot is a system to bring in the contents. So it is unnecessary to make a realistic look for the robot. But more, in, more importantly, the robot needs to help serving the function, you know, bring in the content 
you know, to push the, uh, to nudge the user, hey, you know, you have a message uh, from your daughter. Uh, take a look at that. So I think, um, you know, I can continue to talk about some other exam examples. And when we designing for robotics, there's no one generic formula. Uh, every robot, you know, based on the purpose, based on the, you know, the story uh, to tell, based on how, you know, what is the interaction we, we want the user to engage with the robot, we would design differently, completely differently. So that's the purpose. I want to show you guys different kind of examples. Um, I think the next one is, um, did I answer the question <laughs> before I go to the next one? Uh, yeah, David says it did, and thank you. Um, okay, yeah, we'd like to hear about the SNU. Yes, yeah, so SNU um, is I have a quick the, question. Yep. About Moxie. Yep. Um, it's uh, Hemang again. Um, um, uh, can this, by the way, this is so, so sweet and so endearing, and I can't wait to play with one, and my daughter would love to play with it too, I think. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I, you know, as, as this, uh, you know, COVID-19 has broken out, we have exposed a lot of uh, very early stage technology to our children. And there is obviously a lot of uh, trepidation around addiction and so on to tech uh, for kids. That, and you, you mentioned you also have children, so I'm, I'm sure you're in the same boat. So just mm -hmm. trying to understand in, in terms of the software aspects around parental controls, how, what is your vision of Moxie as well as in general with regards to uh, addiction and robotics and all of that? Thank you. I think, I think um, you know, this is a good, uh, good question. I think Moxie is actually typical to help to reduce screen time. Um, you know, like a lot of people like me working from home. Um, on the other hand, you know, school is not keeping up that much. Um, you know, there's some online classes and some not. And the kids need to just follow the, the list and do the work and they often just finish. Mom, I'm done, you know, like, <laughs> what do I do now? So, you know, I'm doing my work. I also need to assign some other work for her as well. Sometimes I'm too busy and, and then, you know, she, she's allowed to get on the iPad. Um, so on the other hand, I, like I explained, Moxie has helped to remove that screen time because Moxie is able to engage with you, um, you know, to, to tease up, you know, those questions, talk about the joke. Um, you know, it has different themes each week. Um, the purpose of that is like, so you can learn different things. And this week, I, you know, I can learn some, um, you know, how to, how to deal with the, the problem with uh, my friends. Like my daughter sometimes say, oh, um, my friend, um, she's mad today. Why? Um, I'm like, wow, well, <laughs> I would really love to talk to her you know, to understand, to help her. I think that's what Moxie is doing. So Moxie is not, Moxie itself is not a game, right? Moxie itself, it's, a, it's really, um, it's a um, prompt to have the, those kind of education to have, you know, like, you know, talking with the kids like friends. Uh, Moxie can also learn from the kids. Um, so knowing that these kids always have uh, some issues and this helps, you know, help to make friends and Moxie, you know, can bring in some, resource, some information to help. Uh, so um, I think if you are interested to Moxie, you can go to their website um, to, to look at the details. And today, I think we have limited time. I, I can't go into too much detail, but I, I think the purpose is really to, to, to create those kind of uh, engagement to help the social and emotional development rather than you know, screen time, uh, play games. If anyone yeah. is interested about Moxie in general, in the chat, I've dropped in a website link for everyone. Uh, if you go there, Moxie is available for pre-order, and there's a lot more videos that show um, how Moxie can interact with with children and uh, the different ways it, it makes jokes, it tells, it asks riddles, it, it plays all kinds of different games. Yeah, it answers questions differently. You know. When, when Moxie talked to different persons. So it's very, very, um, very, very smart. Um, that, 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 that's very helpful. And I, I think more specifically, is it possible to make sure that it works with the parents so that uh, it stops, you know, it stops working if when the parents want it to stop working? Yes, it, uh, 
it absolutely it does work with the parents uh, so you're able to read the reports uh come from moxie through the interactions yes absolutely so it, it does have a 360 system um it's also upgradable right. be able to grow with the kids uh, when they're older so the content will be upgraded as well yes those are great questions and and i recommend it <laughs> recommend everyone to go on their website to take a look at the, the details so I only know this because I happen to be lucky enough to play with a prototype of Moxie uh, for our photo shoot for the images that you guys just saw in the presentation, uh, but it operates through an app which the parents will manage. Um, and there's an opportunity in the app to put Moxie to sleep at certain times and you can, like Chin was saying, you can see the usage uh, throughout the day and all of that data gets saved, uh, saved on your phone. All right, shall we move on and talk about the next one? Yes, let's do that. Okay. Once you I skipped the video. Um, so SNU is a um, product that was launched in the beginning of 2017. Uh, the project actually took us about five years from concept to production, so that was really long. Um, we collaborate with the American pediatrician, Dr. Harvey Cobb. And, and, you know, this is, um, like I said, this is a very different type of robot in compare with the other two. It's basically, um, it's embedded, it's hidden. Uh, it's really helping um, to assist the, the regular life rather than, you know, being a robot that, as, you know, acting like a robot to interact with you. Um, we, you know, if you are a parent, you know that um, lack of sleep is a very common for new parents. And it's uh, really a common health issue. 50% of baby uh, still wake and cry at night, even though you change diaper, you, you fed them. 15% um, uh, of mothers and 25% of spouse has the postpartum anxiety and depression. Um, so this is uh, directly affecting to the work, the family, the relationship, and even the people around you, and even the society, right? Uh, sometimes really um, directly or indirectly affecting to the infant safety as well. <clears throat> so doc, Dr. Harvey Kopp um, um, really spent his life to, to you know, figure out how to solve this baby sleeping problem. So in his book, uh, some of you might have seen The Happiest Baby, he introduced the 5S, swaddle, shush, uh, swing, side, uh, and suck, pacifier. So that, you know, is really trying to replicate the environment of the womb to help the newborn sleep better and longer. Because one of the reasons why the, why the infant cried, because you know, inside a mo uh, mother's body is always very tight, um, you know, it's always has the noise, uh, it's always moving around. So all of a sudden when they are born, you place them into quiet, um, like, uh, um, uh, space that is, you know, doesn't move around and doesn't have any noise, it's actually scared them. So um, Dr. Cobb came to us for a vision to create a product to be able to extend his method to every parent and that is personalized for each, each baby. So to do that, we know that we need to have hardware that um, with embedded sensors, motors, um, AI, machine learning, data collection that can create personalized human interaction. And it also need to be very comfortable and safe like a womb. So our design, the final design is a very uh, simple modern baby crib uh, with all the technology hidden inside. So different with the other two, you know, this design is to be a piece of furniture, not trying to be a robot to look like a piece of furniture because no parents want to place their baby on a machine. So we work very, very hard with engineers to place all the components and sensors inside the base. So you see this band of um, the wood, um, behind inside this wood band is really all the components, the motors, mm -hmm. the sensors. And the, you know, the sensors and able to detect the sound and the movement. Um, be able to react to shake and plate white noise to help baby sleep. 
Um, we also designed a swaddle with those breathable materials, consider safety, uh, it's soft, stretchable to fit the growing baby. And, you know, talking about safety, the swaddle also needs to be um, connected with the bassinet to be able to, to, um, to, to have the bassinet to work. So because of that, you know, this um, Snoo baby bassinet is the safest baby bed in the world. So I have a video to play. So you can hear kind of the rain of the This is life changing. I wish I had snow when my kids were young. Um, so you can see how the sensors, you know, respond to the cry and then start to create the motions to help baby sleep. <clears throat> so everything is automate, uh, automatic. So there's no controls on the bassinet, but we do design an app uh, really just to help parents to uh, be able to collect the data um, to see, you know, to pair the sleeping data with the growth chart to, you know, to understand the growth of the, of the kids. Um, so that's the, um, that's the design for SNU. Uh, any questions regarding to SNU baby bassinet? If you have otherwise, a question, you can, you can type it in the chat box. Um, otherwise, Chi, you can, you can go on. Yeah. I, let me just move, move along. Um, so AI and robotics, like I said, can live in many forms, depends on what kind of problems that uh, we are solving. Um, so Ori is a robotic furniture that solves the living issues. <clears throat> so we know that uh, living space is getting more and more limited in big cities like San Francisco, New York, Boston, um, there's a new type of apartment called micro housing and has become uh, much more popular because of this issue. Um, so they usually do typically less than 350 square feet and with fully functioning uh, kitchens and bathroom. But often people who live inside feel trapped, you know, because it's really a small space. So we work with us at the startup at uh, MIT uh, Moth Lab to solve the problems of how to live in a small space with, uh, without compromise the quality of life. <clears throat> so this is a robotic system by using a linear actuator, a motor on the track to move the furniture, a low power microcontroller, uh, and a brain that control the movement. And we designed this furniture that can move and with uh, you know, sliding, a slidable bed, uh, working surface, integrated shelving and storage, you can convert from a living room to a bedroom, to the office, to a closet. And the design approach is, again, nothing, you know, there's no technology to be visible outside. The design approach is focusing the look of the furniture, uh, the arrangement of the interior. So it's able to hide the bed under the closet and the couch and transform it transforming become a, a sitting a couch. Um, the design is also um, using modular approach so we can fit two different sides of bed, closets, work surface, shelving, couch, uh, depends on the size and the need of the department. It also come with uh, different kind of material and color and finish um, to you know fit, fit within the, the lifestyle. Um, there is a, a central control on the side of the furniture. And by using, um, again, we work with our, our um, 
technology expert at Fuse Project. Uh, so by using force sensitive, you can actually touch the control to move the furniture without actually pushing it. So it feels magical. Uh, we also designed uh, an app uh, that allows you to control while you're not at home. For example, eight o'clock, you know, you left your apartment and then you just use the app to fold your bed. Um, 2.30 p.m. after lunch, you decided to, to go home to, to be work from home, so you get the desk ready. Uh, 6 p.m., uh, get the living room mode ready, um, hide the bed, hide the closet because the friends will be over. Um, and 10.30, you know, you can dim the lights while you're on the bed. So I think the apps really help to increase the convenience of using the furniture and make it much more seamless um, when, when the furniture transform from one to another. So um, I hope this gives you a breadth of range of robots that we have done at Fuse Project. Um, you know, to me, I feel like design really can enable technology to, to integrate with our life. Uh, the purpose of design is really to elevate the human experience right? based on the purpose and based on the experience that we need to design for. Um, we focus on that. You know, some is hiding the robot, some is showing the robot. And you know, all, doing all of this really to help to shape a better future for us. And that's all. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Um, you, you can raise your hand or type it in the chat box. I have a, I have a question for you, uh, Chen. How did you, how did you get started in all of this? What, what drew you to go into industrial design and design? Um, <laughs> well, this is a simple question, but to me it was a long, long story. Um, so long story short. Actually, um, I'm, I'm actually from China. Um, I, um, um, I, I went to a fine art high school for a study of fine arts for four years. And during that study, I wasn't thinking about to be an industrial designer. Um, I was actually thought about to be a um, graphic designer. Um, but um, the school I wanted to be, and they, they closed for enrollment because they really want to control the proportion of teacher and uh, students. And that's a really, really good school in China. So, um, so I had to open my mind to look into other, um, other disciplines, other categories, interior design, architecture, um, even you know, fine arts, um, paintings, all the stuff. And then I got to know about industrial design. Um, really inspired by a couple um, um, schoolmates uh, that uh, a couple years older than me. They show me designs through the magazines and I got to see you know, how industrial design can, can change people's life. You know, it really can help to improve people's life. So what I was exposed to fine art is really more about self-expression it's more about, you know, I'm enjoying something, I, you know, like it's expressing myself. If I want a couple of people really into that, into that you know, I, I'm good already. But industrial design is really you creating something, you're creating the experience, you're creating the objects. You're really trying to solve a bigger problems and try to improve life to try to elevate the experience for others. Um, you, you know, try to, you know, also these days we try to be more sustainable to make the world better. So to me, um, you know, taking the bigger responsibility is what uh, motivated me to, to be an industrial designer. So long story short. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, there's a question. Oh, hold on a second. Oh. I can ask another question. Sir. Hello, Simran. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Yes. Go for it. Okay. Um, so this is great. I I also want to ask you, um, you know, robotics and you know uh, the the and design. How do you think? Um, the state of the union is uh, in China versus the U.S. 
uh, with regards to people, like for example, the three projects that you shared, um, how much of that is being used in, uh, and will be used in everyday life in China versus the US and how do you feel like that will go? Which, which society will accelerate um, the demand for uh, these types of solutions for everyday life? And also a second, kind of uh, more of a real time question about, you know, given the recent, uh, uh, you know, given all the COVID stuff, how is that going to affect robotics uh, space and, you know, the collaboration we have with China sitting in the US? Lots of good questions and hope I can remember all the questions. And first, let me answer. Um, I mean, based on what I have seen and what I've heard, um, I also travel to China, um, you know, two times or two to four times every year. Um, I think robotics and AI um, has grown super fast in China. Um, it's, you know, it, I, I'm not sure if everyone knows about um, how technology being used in China. For example, um, people these days, um, everybody is using smartphone uh, because smartphone has become much more accessible uh, with all those uh, local Chinese manufacturers. Um, everyone's using WeChat. Everyone's using WeChat for everything. So they use WeChat for, um, you know, even uh, order to go. They use WeChat to, um, you know, send money to everybody. Um, you can just use WeChat for everything. It's been uh, a few years like that already. So last time when I was in China, um, I realized my credit card doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and I have no cash. And I was freaking out. Um, um, so... And 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 never be in a uh, in a place that you know without cash and and make me feel uh, unsafe because in the United States I don't need to carry cash right? I use credit card but in the in China um, you basically use WeChat so every, everybody putting money in in WeChat so I feel like AI um, and robotics has been growing so fast in China. Um, you know, but there's, there's also some other things like such as regulations. Um, you know, I think the U.S. has much better way to controlling the regulations in terms of privacy. Um, you know, in, in China, in the airport, you can see a lot of <clears throat> face recognition um, cameras. Um, so these days, people joking, nobody uh, want to do anything bad on the street because you will get caught. Um, very quickly because the cameras are every, everywhere. So privacy is a concern, um, but um, on the other side in the United States, um, it's, it's um, in a much more controlled way. Um, so I feel like the design that we have done um, can be used everywhere. Because uh, when we design for this, um, we, you know, we think about elder, um, Obviously, you know, there's some different culture, have different situations for elder in the, in the Western country. Um, I think the elder usually living by themselves. <clears throat> in China, used to be living with the families together, but I think now it's also because the children are working, you know, from different city. Um, so lots of um, um, older adults, they do live by themselves. So. There, there are some other similar solutions to help to, to solve those kind of issues. So I do think this is a common, common theme, common prob uh, problems and issues across uh, different kind of culture. Um, I think the companion robot uh, Moxie for children, um, you know, this is something definitely um, would do well in China, Chinese market as well. Um, um, I am a single child. Um, you know, I was born as the first generation of the single child policy. And these days, um, when two single child um, parents can have a, a second child. Um, but I think, you know, living, growing up by myself, um, also doing my, my growth, um, we, we move into an apartment that is like, has higher floors. So I don't tend to I, I usually don't go downstairs, you know, because it's a, a long way to get down and to find people, you know, your friends are not living close by. So I think be able to um, have a way to, um, you know, um, have this kind of robot to help you to, to, to continue to develop those kind of social skills, emotional skills, I, I, I think those are 
you know, also, you know, this problem is also universal. Um, COVID-19 does um, give a huge impact globally. Um, first was in China, um, the manufacturer uh, was shut down, but that was luckily was during Chinese New Year, but they, they, they did extend the Chinese New Year to, you know, all the way up. Uh, to to in in long in long the the period of shutdown um, and which is necessary um, you want to you know reduce the risk of having more people to to get the disease but that does um, affect a little bit uh, we have seen that um, kind of slowing down to some of the um, you know some 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 of the brands some of the projects um, you know, slow slowing down on manufacturing and uh, it does affect to the the product launching or even the generation upgrade uh, for for products, um, but I feel like you know based on some of the ex experience I have, you know we have been working from home for six weeks. Um, the first week was extremely difficult. Um, you know, learn how to be productive, but also not being too crazy, too too much bury yourself in the work. Uh, learn how to schedule your lunchtime, schedule your break. Um, I think, uh, you know, people do learn really fast. The second week, the third week, you know, we pick it up, you know, we get used to, we learn how to quickly adapt to that. So I, I feel like the world is able to change fast, be able to react fast, um, you know, come up with solutions as well. So I do, you know, I'm a very... Um, um, optimistic person. Uh, so I do, you know, see the bright side of this. Um, I feel like, um, you know, a lot of um, people do learn a lot from the COVID situation. Um, <clears throat> like myself, sometimes I was thinking like, you know, this is really uh, bringing the future to now, right? So we have to think about, you know, there's a new way of producing products, right? How, how can we design something to be more sustainable? There's also a new way for people to consume. Like we are, if we are all staying home, you know, what are we, what do we need to consume? I, I don't need to actually, today I'm very formal, but usually I'm very casual. Uh, so how much, uh, you know, the consumer goods you need to consume is completely different. Um, you know, how, you know, how is, is that affecting to the delivery system, e-commerce, um, how you know how we can help our clients, help um, those organizations and startups to react fast, to be able to adjust to this um, you know COVID situation or learn from it, you know, to get ready for the next whatever situation. So um, I feel like you know this actually prompt us to be more creative uh, to come up with solutions. And you know, also talking about COVID, I, I feel like you know this kind of products like Moxie, uh, like um, Edicules really help to connect people, right? To help to shorten the distance, to really help each other to, um, to feel less lonely, to, you know, to feel, still feel engaged with, uh, with, the, uh, with the friends and family. So I hope I answer most of the questions, if I remember them, because <laughs> you do ask a lot of questions. Um, um, Hamon, did you have anything else to add to that? Or? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know, I, the the only thing about uh, the last part about COVID was more about specifically around manufacturing and stuff. And I think some of your manufacturing in China as well as huge projects. So is there? You feel like there's a lot of change there um, and so on. That that was basically the premise of my question. I, I think I really appreciate your answer overall about that uh, and the design aspect. Cool. I can I can hear you well, but I I think I heard that you uh, you happy with my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That works for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, we're almost out of time. I have one more question that came in in the chat. Let me read it out. Um, and it's from Ario. Ario is asking, what research methods do you use to validate your designs? Qualitative quantitative or a mix of both? We do both. Um, in terms of research, it's also, we, we also being flexible with our clients. Sometimes clients have the capability uh, to do research. Uh, sometimes um, 
you know, they will count on us. Um, so, you know, some of the projects that we do, you know, since we design for some of the projects we design for different markets. So, for example, we have to fly to Japan, we have to fly to, um, uh, you know, South America, um, Africa, to actually be able to bring the prototype um, to sit there, um, to to see how the user interact with the products. So um, we, um, you know, like I said, we're very flexible. We're also very familiar with um, the research process and also really appreciate um, that designer can actually go in um, to, to show the design to the users and be able to hear feedback uh, in real, real-time feedback. So it was really beneficial. Um, you know, I, I still have a, uh, I have a really great experience a few years ago when I was in Japan and showing the design um, to the Japanese user and be able to understand the culture. It's something that I was thinking uh, can be perceived very different with, with Japanese culture, with different kinds of culture. So it was really uh, great to have, you know, designer to be in field to do the research to interact, um, you know, to, to, to be able to listen to the, um, the feedback. All right. All right. Well, it looks like we are out of time. Um, Chin, thank you so much for this talk. It was so informative and, you know, just great to hear about the products that you're working on and like how important they are and like what we need, you know, we're all looking for in this new world that we're in. Um, and Harriet, thank you for organizing all of this. Um, thank you. The, I have recorded the video. It'll be up on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel, Canopy Space. Um, and I have events all the time. So if you want to sign up to our newsletter, you can visit our website, www.canopy.space and sign up and you can see what else we have going on. Um, and Harriet, I hope that we can do another one soon. Yes, likewise. Thank you so much, Simran, for setting this up for us. Of course. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yep. And have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.